Well, okay then. Once more the question, where am I? Oh my. But something has changed. Although I quite don't know what. And what is this sign saying? Hmm, I don't know. Maybe I just go on. Where was I? Oh yes, I've covered the adventures of Tintin until the death of his creator. And then? Oh, time to take a look at the legacy of Tintin. So, let's take a look at what Hergé left behind. The story of Tintin is also a story of development. The first adventure, Tintin in the land of the Soviets. Hergé, a young artist, wanting to become a reporter, but he couldn't, so he invented a fictional character. An alter ego that he could send on adventures wherever and whenever he wanted to. And Hergé wanted to set Tintin's first adventure in the United States, because he wanted Tintin to fight for the rights of the Native Americans. The editor-in-chief of the magazine Hergé was working for had other plans. He wanted Hergé to send Tintin to the Soviet Union. The editor-in-chief Norbert Vallée wanted a piece of propaganda against the godless country of the Soviets. So he gave Hergé one book a piece of propaganda to inform himself about Soviet Russia. But this book, it was called Moscow Sans Voyer, Moscow Unveiled by Joseph Duyer, is of doubtful accuracy. In later years, Hergé insisted that Tintin in the Land of the Soviets is not a part of the official series. The story was never reworked and never colored and it was only published as it was. And it never became a part of the running series. If you look at the comic books, in most countries, this one has the number zero. However, in Belgium at the time, the late 1920s, it was a big success and the adventures went on. And again, Hergé wanted to send his fearless reporter to the United States, but he couldn't once more. Norbert Vallée had other plans. This time Tintin should show the children of Belgium the Belgian colony of Congo. Unfortunately, this story has the typical view of a middle European man in the 1920s, 1930s. Which means there are a lot of stereotypes. Like, the Africans behave like little children and Tintin always has to help them. And in addition to that, this story is very well known for its animal cruelty. But in that time, when somebody traveled to the Congo, going on a safari, killing animals for sport was something that they did. Hergé later admitted that his portrayal of the Congo and the African people was more than naive. After this story was finished, it was finally time for Hergé to get his wish granted and Tintin went to America. Hergé's style had very much improved since Tintin in the land of the Soviets and he did research. He was fascinated by the culture of the American natives and one can see this in the story. The next destination of Tintin was the Far East. Well, okay, Far East, that's a matter of perspective. Far East if you live in Europe, yes. The story started with a cruise through the Mediterranean Sea and Tintin traveled from Egypt to Arabia and finally to India, following a gang of drug smugglers. Hergé planned the story to go on to China and at this point he was approached by a vicar. 
This vicar was concerned because Hergé had made several mistakes about the culture in other countries in the stories beforehand, and he wanted to avoid this in this new story. So the vicar introduced Hergé to Chang Chong Chen, a Chinese student living temporarily in Brussels. From Chang, Hergé learned a lot about China and the Chinese culture, and it changed Hergé's view. The first part of the story of Tintin in the Far East became the title Cigars of the Pharaoh and its continuation The Blue Lotus. And The Blue Lotus is considered by many fans as one of the best Tintin stories. It is here that Hergé finally learns that there's not always the European perspective of things. In this story there's a Japanese-Chinese conflict and Hergé takes position of the Chinese, contrary to the European politics at the time, who stood with Japan. Hergé continued with this different kind of view in the next story, The Broken Ear. The story shows that a conflict between two South American countries is actually fueled by two competing oil companies. The next two stories were conceived before the background of an upcoming war in Europe. The Black Island is about counterfeiters who want to damage the economy of a country, while King Ottokar's scepter is about a coup d'etat. Interestingly, Hergé predicts how the German Reich will invade neighboring Poland under false grounds. The story The Crab with the Golden Claws takes a step back from politics. Again, it's about drug smuggling. And the story contains the first encounter of Tintin and Captain Haddock. Hergé takes up the pessimistic mood in Europe in view of the war in the Shooting Star. At the beginning of the story it is said that the world will end. But then a wild hunt for a meteoroid half submerged in the sea develops. The story is also rather apolitical. After this point, Hergé began developing longer stories, which were later split up in two books. This was already the case with Tintin in the Far East, but at that time the first story didn't end with a cliffhanger and could have stood alone. This is not the case with the double story The Secret of the Unicorn and Red Rackham's Treasure. Tintin and Haddock are looking for said treasure and get to know Professor Calculus. The next two-part story is titled The Seven Crystal Balls and the Temple of the Sun. Seven researchers fall victim to the curse of Raskar Kapak. And then Professor Calculus is kidnapped. Tintin and Haddock travel to Peru to find him. Hergé has improved his way of working here again. In the meantime he collected pictures, magazine and journals, including the National Geographic, in order to do research. In the land of black gold, the next story stands out a bit because it is only one book long. Hergé had actually started it earlier but was forced to interrupt it due to the German invasion of Belgium. After all, the villain of the story was Dr. Müller, a German. After the war he was able to start afresh and finish the story, which again deals with oil supplies. But Hergé went back to two-part stories. Destination Moon and Explorers on the Moon tells how Tintin and his friends went on a moon trip long before Neil Armstrong. The story convinces with its high degree of realism. But life became more and more stressful for Hergé and he went back to one-part stories. The next was an exciting spy thriller called The Calculus Affair. For this comic Hergé even traveled to Geneva to choose locations for the story. In Geneva you can actually spend the night in the hotel where Calculus stayed. Hergé had read the background to the next adventure, The Red Sea Sharks, in a newspaper article. It was about people who were kidnapped on the pilgrimage to Mecca and sold as slaves. Slave trade in the 20th century. Of course, this was a subject worthy of a Tintin story. In Hergé's private life, however, more and more things went wrong. He, a devout Catholic, had to learn that the dogma of eternal love that the church proclaims at marriages does not always come true. The love for his wife had died and he had fallen in love again. 
Because of this moral conflict, he got nightmares of dancing skeletons and large blank white spaces. He processed the whole thing in a very private story, in which one notices the level of suffering the author was under. Tinted in Tibet is Urge's most private book and is loved by many fans. Urge continued to process personal moods in his stories. In The Cast of Your Emerald, Tintin doesn't go out into the world to find adventure. Adventure comes to Marlin Spike. And again, it's about prejudice and how Tintin helps the weak in society. With Flight 714 to Sydney, science fiction found its way into the Tintin stories. The fact that aliens and UFOs showed up here was not approved by every fan, but that element only took up a small part of the story. Around it, there is an adventure about a plane hijacking and how Tintin escapes his arch enemy Roberto Rastapopoulos. Eger became socially critical again in his last complete work, Tintin and the Picaros. Again he ends up in South America and again it's about overcoming a tyrant. At the same time, Hergé shows what so-called civilization does when, for example, the indigenous Arambayas are turned into alcoholics. And then there's the last comic book, the unfinished one, Tintin and Alf Art. As it stands, it was planned to be the finale. Hergé never completed this because he died. In his will he decreed that no one should tell new Tintin stories. His heirs left it at that. Tintin and Alf Art was published as incompletely as it was, and no new Tintin story has appeared since 1983. But the Belgian reporter's fame remained unbroken. And so, then there was something new. And I want to take a look at that. <laughs>